Let's open our Bibles together to Genesis chapter 5. Our theme is a fierce obedience, and I'm going to share in an opening way tonight out of verses 21 through 24 a portion of Scripture that has spoken to my heart. And, and as I was considering uh, my study, this is what stood out to me. I wanted to lay a foundation because I know that tomorrow our speakers are going to bring a good word of exhortation and instruction. It's going to be stimulating and a blessing. Um, there will be men with us tomorrow who weren't able to be with us tonight. It's going to be a great, great morning and great time. And then our brother Tony is going to be sharing at our fellowship on Sunday morning. It's going to be a real blessing to have him with us the second time. But I wanted to lay a foundation today because we're talking about obedience and and, and all of that. And I thought I'd like to begin with a, uh, a man that all of us are familiar with. It's found here in chapter 5 of Genesis. And uh, he's found in verses 21 through 24. Let me read that to you. Then I'm going to give to you a prolonged introduction, laying some foundations and then move into some application from this passage. So beginning at verse 21, reading to verse 24. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Father, we ask that you would help us to understand a few things, especially walking with you and you taking us. Because, Lord, we're living in a time when, Father, we want to walk with you, in a time where, where the world is in opposition to, to us living for you. So I'm asking, Lord, that, that you would speak to us now as we look at a few things in the life of Enoch. And again, our, our, our hearts are open. Speak to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin by referring first to an Old Testament prophet by the name of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, when you read the book of Jeremiah and all, Jeremiah ministered during very dark days in the history of Israel. He ministered some 627 to 580 before Christ. And so by the time of his writing, God was already moving, bringing judgment against the nation of Israel. It had been divided into two separate units. There was the northern tribes and the southern tribes. And, and God had already begun to bring judgment uh, on, on the nation. He had already judged the ten northern tribes, and then a century later, God had turned his attention to the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. Now, when you read the book and all, you need to remember some things. Let me lay this as a foundation. At one time, Judah was deeply devoted to the Lord. As a nation, they had been devoted and faithful to him. He was their God. They were his people. So through Jeremiah, God reminded the nation of this. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, he said, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness to the Lord, the firstfruits of his increase. So God spoke to them. He said, I remember I remember how you loved me. I remember how you followed me. I remember how you depended upon me. And I remember how you lived for me. But that could no longer be said of them. They had left their first love. They abandoned the Lord. They became backsliders. They became idolaters. They defiled the land. They exchanged the knowledge of God for false gods. What had led to this? Well, rebellious unbelief. Rebellious and belief that was fostered by the priests and by the prophets. The priests and the prophets didn't handle the law of the Lord properly. The priests didn't have a relationship with God and the prophets prophesied by Baal. The unbelieving priests didn't rightly divide God's word. In Jeremiah 2 verse 8 it says, The priests did not say, Where is the Lord? And those who handle the law did not know me. In Jeremiah 2, 11 through 13, the question is asked, Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. Be astonished, O heavens, at this. Be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. 
They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They had created a religious system devoid of God. It had every aspect of religiosity with no spirit. And because of that, God determined to bring judgment on the nation. At first, he tried to get their attention. He chastened them, but they wouldn't repent. Instead, they fashioned a form of godliness by being outwardly religious. Jeremiah 2.22 says, Though you wash yourself with lie, use much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. In other words, your stains are not on your skin, it's in your soul. And it can't be washed off with water. And it can't. And can't be washed with soap. So instead of rejecting them forever, God called out to them and he said, return. He made a way for them. All they needed to do was repent and come back to him. In Jeremiah 4.11, if you will return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return to me. And if you will, put away your abominations out of my sight. Then you shall not be moved. To intensify the sins of Judah, God challenged the city of Jerusalem. In Jeremiah 5, 1, he said, Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know, and seek in her open places if you can find a man, if there's anyone who executes judgment, who seeks the truth. I will pardon her. Thoroughly search out this magnificent city. Find one man who's faithful and just. You see, truth and faithfulness are qualities governing a relationship with God and man. Surely, this great city must have one faithful man among so many. Find him for me. If such a man is found, God said, I will spare the city. Now that reminds me of what occurred in the time of the prophet Ezekiel, who prophesied 592 to 570 BC. He prophesied around the same time as Jeremiah. He spoke of the destruction by Babylon in Ezekiel 22, 29 through 31. The people of the land practice extortion, commit robbery. They oppress the poor and needy, mistreat the alien, denying them justice. I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not destroy it, but I found none. So I will pour out my wrath on them and consume them with my fiery anger, bringing down on their own heads all they have done, declares the Lord. I looked for a man, but I found none. And I will bring judgment on them for all that they have done. And no such man was found, and God did bring judgment on that nation. Now we fast forward for a moment to the 21st century. We make application to our own nation. Now these words obviously belong to Israel, but they can still apply to us today. Because I believe that God is still looking for men who are just and righteous, who will stand in the gap. I believe God wants to work in our nation and still uses men who are committed to him, and he has not given up on us yet. He is giving us space to repent and to return to him. You see, some of us don't realize, or perhaps because times have changed in our day where history is no longer a subject that people think is required to have a good education. So we don't know the history of our own nation. Many of us don't know this, the history of this great nation that we love so much. And so let me share a few things with you just to remind you of, of, our, of our nation, because some don't know that our nation's foundations are fundamentally Christian. The pilgrims arriving here were seeking religious freedom. The first college, Harvard, which was founded in 1646, was founded to train Christian ministers. Think about that for a moment. Harvard was founded to train Christian ministers. Some religious group or denomination established the first 126 colleges. There are people who say, what have Christians ever done that's worth? We've, we've founded our faith, brothers and sisters in the Lord in another time, founded the first 126 colleges in the United States. Of the 55 men who signed the Constitution, all but three were Orthodox Christians. Many don't know that the first act of Congress authorized the printing of 20,000 Bibles for the evangelization of Native Americans. The greatest American ever, George Washington, in his farewell address, said these things. George Washington said, Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality 
are indispensable supports. Let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. That was Washington. We've drifted from our moorings. It's time to come back. As a nation, I believe we are guilty of what God condemned Israel for. We've become sinful. We have become guilty. We are evil. And we are, as a nation, corrupt. We are in a spiritual war that is being waged for the soul of America. Satan is after this nation. And this nation is built on faith in Christ, but in a practical sense, is built on marriages and family. And we men must be willing to rise up, and we need to be willing to fight for these things. In Nehemiah 4.14, we read, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. God has called us as men to do that, to fight in the name of the Lord, not with, with, with uh, physical weapons, but in a spiritual sense, by being leaders, by being open about our faith, by learning to give devotions to our children and ministering to our wives, by, by those of us who are married, that we would become in their sight their greatest example of a believer in Jesus Christ. A long time ago, and I've said this to our fellowship, some of you perhaps have heard me say it in the past, but a long time ago, I made a decision because I know that young people need heroes. I know that. And I, I told our church, perhaps you were here then, I told our church this. I said, my children don't need to look outside of the four walls of their home to find a hero because they ought to have one living with them. And that's me, not their mama. That's me. You ought to be the same. You ought to make the determination that when your children speak of a great man, that the name they mention is yours. That your wife, when asked who is the greatest man that, that you know, you will be the person that she speaks of. You ought to make that your aim. You ought to make it your aim to be that man on the job site that, that guys know. Well, they may call you a freak. They may call you weird, or that's that religious guy over there. But at least you're known for something good. And you ought to make that your aim. Because this nation needs to wake up. We're going in the wrong direction, and we've been tailspinning for a long time. And you know that's true. But we need to understand the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. We will not wage a spiritual war with carnal fleshly weapons. Ephesians 6.10 says, My brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of His might. We need to be men of the Spirit. We need to be men committed to the Lord completely. And God is still looking for that man. In 2 Chronicles 16.9, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to Him. There was a great man of another time by the name of D.L. Moody. And D.L. Moody said, The world has yet to see what God will do with a man fully consecrated to Him. I determined to be that man. And I believe that we can do that tonight also. God, use me for your glory. God, use me in my family. God, use me in our church. God, use me in my neighborhood. God, use me. I want to be used by you. That ought to be our prayer. You see, the Lord is desiring to, to use a man who is committed to faithful obedience to him. And a good example of such a man is right before us, a man by the name of Enoch. And so Enoch, here in verse 21 through 24 in Genesis 5, the name Enoch is translated dedicated. And this man Enoch is mentioned various times in both the Old and the New Testament, and we're first introduced to him here in this passage of Genesis. Notice how Moses speaks concerning him. In this passage, Moses wrote that Enoch walked with God. Now, what would Moses be referring to, and what can we learn to help us to walk with God? Well, the writer of Hebrews gives us insight in Hebrews 11, 5, and 6. He said, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. 
But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He was a man who walked by faith and pleased the Lord. And in this passage, we have several elements that, that help to give us an insight into walking obediently with God. The first and most obvious thing is he had a personal saving faith in God. The Bible says to us that prior to our conversion to Christ, our coming to faith in Christ, prior to us being born again, we were in continuous rebellion against God. Romans 8, 7, Paul says it like this, the, the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. So we were hostile in opposition to God. To become obedient begins by obeying his call to come to him and be born again. And after that happens, you receive a new nature. You're no longer in bondage to sin. That's the beginning of your new walk, this walk with God. You see, for Enoch to be pleasing to God speaks of him being forgiven and walking in faith. Romans 4, 5 says, To him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. This man had a walk with God, and he was righteous, and he pleased the Lord. A second element is his walk with God wasn't seasonal. It was consistent. His walk was one of those walks that was going forward continuously. It was developing. It was maturing over a lifetime. At the end of the year, he could look back and see he had made progress, and he was able to do that for 365 years. Think about that for just a moment. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. It was consistent. It wasn't seasonal. You know, um, when I was a young man, there was a team that I used to follow that I really liked. I still have a sentimental value for them, but I don't like them that much anymore because they're losers. <laughs> the Bruins... UCLA, shut your mouth. <laughs> they were, um, I started, in, I won't tell you, too, too, it won't take too long to tell you this, but I, I started enjoying them in my early teens. And it became one of those things that they never lost. I mean, when they were playing at Poly Pavilion, when it first was built, they only lost two games and won a hundred and some games. I mean, you couldn't beat the Bruins. Several undefeated seasons. They were an amazing team. And I, I really grew to like them, especially when uh, Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar played for them. And, uh, you know, I really liked them. And so I was teaching Bible studies, and they were still in NCAA championships and all. And I still remember uh, I was teaching a Bible study in Roland Heights. And it was a... Uh, it was one of the NCAA tournament games, and I was upstairs in my bedroom watching the game, and my Bible study people were sitting downstairs <laughs> waiting for me. I mean, I, 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 I was just caught up with them. I was caught up with them, and, and that, that was me. I, mean, I was this guy who I, I would get mad when they lost. When they lost to North Carolina State, I believe it was in 70, 73 72. See, I was stationed ah, right at that time. I was, I, was, I was stationed in North Carolina, and I had a friend who was a North Carolina State fan, and North Carolina State had been disqualified uh, and were, were, non, were unable to play in the tournament that year, and the Bruins won. And he said, well, you know what? If, if, if NC State was there, we'd have beaten you. So I went into this game. You know, the, it was, uh, it was uh, the game just prior to the finals, I went into this game expecting the Bruins to win. And in my heart, even though I was already out of the service, I was, I was going to thumb my nose at this guy. And they were, they were up by eight points in overtime and lost. And I still remember getting up. And I just, I was so angry, so emotional, angry. And I was, I can't believe this. Bill Walton, you're vegetarian. You should have eaten some meat. <laughs> I was so mad. <laughs> that's true. I mean, that's, that's true. Eat a steak and get some strength in you. What's wrong with you? And as I was storming around the, 
the den, my father's den, God's Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, why are you so mad? You didn't even go to that school. <laughs> That's true. Why? Now that didn't cure me, but it got me on the road to recovery. <laughs> you can get caught up about so many things, guys, that don't matter. And it's not that sports isn't fun. It's supposed to be entertaining, right? It's supposed to be amusing, amusement, right? You know what the word amusement means, by the way? It means without thinking. The word muse means thought. When you put the A in front of muse, amuse, ah, without thinking. Amusement is intended to keep you from thinking. And that's what amusement is. That's what entertainment is. It's keeping you from thinking. And so I see these games now on occasion. Um, I don't care if they win or lose, as long as they beat SC. <laughs> <laughs> it's still there. You know, some demons are hard to come out. Randy here, and my, my dear friend Randy is an SC fan. Yes. I don't know why I let you sit in the front. I wasn't thinking. Yeah, I'm amused. <laughs> What's the most important thing to you? I love the Dodgers, you may not. I do, I don't care, boo. <laughs> My dad took me to a ball game when they first moved out from New York. And I sat in that Coliseum and I saw Duke Snyder and all those old guys and that was, that was for me, that was it. You know, angels are a good farm team. <laughs> Yeah, I hate the Nationals, but whatever, I won't travel down that road. I'll tell you, what is it that, that grabs you? You know, because sometimes guys will think, well, you know, naturally, Pastor, you, you, you got away from all of that passion for sports and things, and I was very passionate for it, very, really was. Um, that's just because you're old and you can't play anymore. Well, no, I would like to believe it's because another love grabbed my heart. I would like to believe that. A, d a deeper, a deeper love, a deeper affection, a deeper interest. And, and, and I would like to believe, and I, I think it's true, that over time I realized that, that, that my teams will let me down. And they do. They do. They lose. Everybody loses. But you know what? We don't want our teams to lose. But God never does. And it's one of those things that in my life has really been, I've been transformed. So, so yeah, I still enjoy sports. And yeah, I still, of course, I like to watch it when I can. But there's something got to be greater. I've got to be known for something deeper. And, and that may sound very petty to you and, and even, even inconsequential. But it's, it's really not, guys. Because if you look within your own heart, ask yourself, what gets you most excited? What gets you most passionate? What is the thing that you're most caught up with? You may be surprised. It may not be the Lord. It may be something else. It may be something else. And your, your faith may be seasonal. We, we, you know, we, we, we make sure to celebrate Christmas. We make sure to celebrate uh, Easter. We make sure to do certain religious things. But, but what the Lord wants for us and what Enoch is a model of for us is a consistency. He walked continuously and consistently with the Lord, not one week or one month or one year or 30 years or 100 years. He walked consistently with God for 365 years, and he pleased God so much that God just took him to be with him. Now think about this for a moment, because he could have given in to compromise, but he didn't. He remained steadfast in his walk. He lived when the earth was growing more and more evil. And you see that in chapter 6 here in the book of Genesis, verse 5, where it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
In Luke 17, Jesus in verses 26 and 27 said it like this. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. We see this kind of situation today. There is a continual onslaught of the normalization of sin. The outrage over the exposure of sexual sin and confusion over it is stunning, even staggering. When you look at the different influences, for example, Hollywood, Hollywood in the movies and all consistently glamorizes casual sex, and everybody's heard of the casting couch. In politics, politics is filled with the privileged and elite who have become millionaires as servants of the public. You have TV personalities who are famous for doing anything to get ahead, and yet they're looked at as being the philosophers of our age. You have the music industry that has no moral compass. They sing words that can't even be printed. You can't, if I were to take some of the words and read it to my church, just, oh, by the way, this is the latest song, and read those words to the church, they would they, my, my church would be outraged. How, how could you read words like that? And yet many of them listen to those songs on the way home from church. Don't even realize it. Don't even think about it. But the words can't even be printed and read out loud because it's hidden by the music and the beat and everything else that goes along with that. There's no moral compass. The print media cannot be trusted. The educational system is undermining morals. We've got, we've got men who dress as women reading stories to babies in public libraries. And that's looked at as being okay. We've got athletics. You know, in athletics, there are men competing as women in athletics right now, and they're winning too. And you would think that uh, the women livers would be happy about that, but apparently... They're not. We're living in a time where we just don't have a clue what's going on. I I heard something today. I I wrote it down so I can read it. It's just take a second. And and, uh, don't worry, I'm not going to get political on you, but I want you to hear something. This will help you. Because today, uh, one of the uh, the wannabe candidates for for president, um, Elizabeth Warren, uh, rolled out uh, one of her plans uh, to get uh, medical uh, insurance and all to every American. Perhaps you read that. I wonder how many of you guys heard that. Did you, did you hear? Some of you did, but not all of you. She, she brought out a plan, and her plan is going gonna, is gonna to cost $52 trillion. <coughs> $52 trillion. Okay, I just used a number none of us understand. So let me help you. Somebody said this, and I wrote it down. One million, that's the number some of us can get our head around. So one million seconds, one million seconds equals about 11 days. 52 trillion seconds equals 1,648,000 years. Okay, that sunk, didn't it? You hit me. (laughs) 1,648,000 years. That's what she's talking about. Who's going to pay for it? But what we have, you are. What we have, <laughs> me, I'm going to go to an island. <laughs> no. <laughs> what we have, guys, and I won't, I won't belabor this, is we're living in a, so- a society that is in a great war right now. It's a war of, of good versus evil. It's, it's a war about faith versus a lack of faith. That's what we're dealing with right now. That is the current that you're living in right now, and it's pressing you into its mold. Even Christians will get upset. Listen, um, we've gotten so cynical that when somebody like Kanye comes out and, and says that he's a follower of Christ, 
maybe maybe we've become jaded maybe 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 something's happened to our heart but when you when you read the facebook posts and people are saying i doubt it i, I i'm i'm thinking uh, and i wrote something today on facebook i said you know i came from a generation that the the society older than us disrespected we were hippies and we were the we were the scum we were the ones that there was no hope for. And so when we came to faith in Christ, there were people who doubted us. And, and, and I, 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 I don't know about you. I believe in a God who transforms lives. I believe in a God who saves. I believe a God who fills you with his spirit. And, and we ought to be praying for guys like Kanye. It's one thing to be sitting in your, in your, in your front room typing furiously your opinions on Facebook or whatever, you know, oh, I'm doing so much good for God right now. I sit here and rip somebody else up. Maybe they ought to go out in the street and talk about Jesus for a while and see what happens when you do that and see what Kanye is giving up right now when he's saying, I'm a follower of Christ. We need to pray for men like that. We need to pray that more men like that will be raised up. But guess what? We don't need Kanye. We got you. You can do the work of ministry. You can reach people he never will. That's what God has called us to do, to take things seriously, to walk with him consistently. And in the midst of the evil that we live in, to shine his lights that Jesus Christ might be glorified. That's what he told us to do. And that's what the church is called to do. We're living in a time that of Isaiah 5, 20 and 21. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Tozer said something that I appreciated. A.W. Tozer, he said, we have learned to live with unholiness and have come to look upon it as the natural and expected thing. That's what's happened. It's the natural and expected thing. Well, Enoch lived in such a world, but he did not allow it to shape him into its mold. He did not remain silent. He spoke out clearly against the ungodliness and blasphemy. In the book of Jude, verses 14 and 15, he writes, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Enoch was the one who did this work. He held his ground. He gave out God's word even though he was mocked and rejected. Spurgeon said, Enoch lived when few loved God. He lived toward the close of those primitive times wherein long lives had produced great sinners. Do not complain, therefore, of your times and of your neighbors and other surroundings, for amid them all you may still walk with God. So he didn't allow the world to press him into a God-rejecting mold, and neither do we. And he did this because he loved the Lord and desired God above all other things, and his heart desired the Lord in an undivided way, and he was committed totally to him. And that's what we're to do. We're to walk with him and grow to love him daily. And we don't allow our hearts to become divided. We remain deeply committed to him. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If we're not alert, we will cease being outraged by the evil that is accepted. There are pastors, and I'll speak of my own tribe, if you will, pastors, who think it's cool to use profanity when they're preaching the most holy word, the gospel. But they take the, the holy table and they use it to give polluted bread speaking corrupt words, trying to be cool and with it and relevant. There are others who think it's cool to give the word and then go to a bar after church, spend some time with their elders drinking some wine because that's sophisticated, sitting in their libraries with their cigars and their brandy. 
or the world is going to hell in a handbasket. And these pastors are living unholy lives. And if a pastor lives an unholy life, what will his sheep be like? Because like shepherd are the sheep. And when that man does not live a life sold out for Jesus Christ, neither will his sheep. And sheep can smell hypocrisy. They can smell it on that man. And I'm telling you, we need to be alert and aware of who we are and who we represent as a group. We need to remember that. We need to be transformed and not conformed. In, in 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8, uh, the scripture says he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men. That righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. You see, our, word, our world celebrates delusion and ridicules those who don't agree. Bruce Jenner was recognized as woman of the year. Think about that for a moment. How do you feel about that? Well, the psalmist, Psalm 119, 139, my zeal wears me out, for my enemies ignore your word. In Malachi 3.15, now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evildoers prosper, and even those who challenge God escape. Somebody said, we are not diplomats, but prophets, and our message is not a compromise, but an ultimatum, and that's true. You see, Enoch walked with God when the world rejected God. He held fast to his integrity and sought fellowship with him unwaveringly. In Proverbs 25, 26, it says, like a, a muddied spring or a polluted well is a righteous man who gives way to the wicked. He didn't give way to the wicked. He walked in integrity. He maintained his relationship. He kept his walk with God his top priority. Psalm 86, 11, and 12, teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forevermore. You see, this longing for God fuels our obedience to him and his word. And remember, it doesn't happen overnight. You get saved, but you don't become Billy Graham the next morning. It takes time. And, and growing in your walk is a lifetime of pursuit. And you pursue him. Jeremiah 29, 13, you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. And so you wake up in the morning and you say to the Lord, here am I, Lord. Speak to my heart today. Use me for your glory, Lord. People say, well, it's easy for you to say you're a pastor. That's what you're supposed to do. I was doing that long before they called me Pastor David. I was doing that as a young believer. And I, was, I don't want to ever pretend that I was some kind of solid, great superstar Christian. I wasn't. I was, I, was, I was a young believer, and I was learning how to walk with God. I made a lot of sinful mistakes to this day. Wish I hadn't, but I did. But guess what? They went into my life to make me aware of who I am now without Jesus. And I learned a lot of lessons. And over time, I began to think, I want to just be used by God. I just, in whatever way you want. You know, in my heart, I wanted to be a pastor teacher. I had that sense of call. People have asked me, when did you know you were called to be a pastor? And the answer is, the day I got saved. The day I got saved, there was a sense inside of me this is what I want to do. Because I went home, told my mom and dad, you know, I said, you know, mom, dad, Becky, Madeline, I love you, praise the Lord. Talked to my sisters afterwards, and, and uh, my sister Madeline went to bed and gave her heart to Jesus Christ that night, the very first convert of my, of my ministry. And I began to see the joy of people coming to faith in Christ. There's nothing greater than to see somebody who is going to hell turned around going to heaven. There's nothing greater than that. Then to know your mom and your dad and your sister and your, your brother, your, your relatives ha have found the truth of Christ through you. There's nothing like that to see that. What, what, what makes you excited again? You know, for me, I, I, get, I, I get such a thrill in seeing those whom I love walking with Jesus like John spoke about it in his epistles. You know, it gives me no greater joy than to see my children walking in truth. That's the way it is, guys. What's your greatest joy? What is it that, 
that gets you going, what wakes you up in the morning and, and fuels you through the day, and is it eternal? Is it eternal? Because it has to be. You see, there are results in a long walk in the same direction because according to verse 24, Enoch walked with God. He was not for God took him. It doesn't say he died. It says God took him. He removed him from the world of terrible evil and relieved his burdened heart. He, he took him as he walked with the Lord, and their fellowship just continued into eternity. And that is the reward, being with him, knowing him, the only true God in Jesus Christ. You see, the reward of the righteous is to be with him. One day we're going to be with him. In John 14, 1 through 3, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. For where I am, there you may be also. And my father gave his heart to Christ. I was a young man at that time. And my dad gave his heart to Jesus. I was 20 years old. My dad was 40. 44. He had just turned 44. And I was not only his son, but over time I was his pastor. I led my father to faith in Christ as well as my mother. And then when I went to the military, came out, I began a Bible study in September of 1973 in my parents' home. And as I began that Bible study there in my parents' home, my first Bible students my mom and my dad, my sisters, and then some neighbors, any neighbor I could bribe to bring over, pay them something. <laughs> they would come and listen to me speak at the age of 23. And I ministered to my father and became not just his son, David, but I became his pastor, his pastor, David. And right now, as I'm standing here, guys, my father came when we bought this property. We didn't have these chairs, then we had some very ugly pews, I think, or chairs. I, do you remember, Randy? Pews, pews, ugly. But my mom and my dad, I could tell you, my mom and my dad, where they sat, every Sunday, my dad would sit just a few rows back right here on the side, and he'd always have his arms folded and looking at me. And my dad would have that, and you know what this feels like. My dad, and you too, Randy. My dad would just sit there looking at me. This is my son, but he's also my pastor. And he respected me. And a lot in my ministry, it's sobriety. And and comes because my dad was, he needed, he needed, he needed someone to show him how to walk with God. Because my dad never had a Bible in his life. He wouldn't allow a Bible in our house. My mother had a Bible. She hid. That's the one thing I know my mother did that he didn't want her to do. She hid her Bible because the only person my dad ever knew who had read the Bible was crazy. So he thought that the Bible made you crazy. So he told my mom, you can't have the Bible in the house. My mom was reading Isaiah because my mom would read it. And she found a portion that says, and a little child shall lead them. So when I got saved, it was out of context, but that phrase stuck with her. So when I got saved and I came home and I told my parents about Jesus, my mom said, this is what that verse means. This is what it means. This little child is going to lead me. And guess what, guys? I did. I led them to faith in Christ. I was their example of a believer and I buried both of them. And I will always be grateful that God gave to me the opportunity to live before them, to walk in faith, so that my mom and my dad, I can say, I, I didn't say goodbye to them. I said, see you later, because I will see them again in glory. And that's what it's about. That's what it's about. Walk with God. Walk with God and, 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 and put away things that don't matter. Walk with the Lord. There's a reward for the righteous. For when, 
my father was dying. He was he was dying. He was he, he was like in a he was in in a, a, a coma, and Daddy was there, and I stood next to him, and I was looking at him, and I quoted to him John fourteen, you know. I shared with him, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And I still remember touching my dad's head. He, he No response anymore. And no, just touching my father on the head. And I said, Jesus is a place for you, Daddy. Jesus has a place for you. And when my mother, who had fallen, she had broken her back, and she stayed in a bed for a year. She was bedridden, going through dementia. And I went and saw her the last time before she died. And there she is laying in this bed, just a frail little shell of a woman. She died not, not, not long after that last visit. And I remember touching my mom's hand, and she's just demented looking in my direction, not really sure that she's looking at her son anymore. And I said the same thing to her. There's a reward for the righteous. And I kissed her goodbye, but I'll see her again. And I, I loved my, my dad goodbye, but I'll see him again. Walk with God. Walk with God. There's nothing greater. You can get anything the world has to offer, guys. Please remember this. Anything that the world has to offer will perish. It all does. There's only one thing that doesn't, and that's what is done for Christ. That remains forever. And may your life be that kind of life. May it be that kind of life. And so I'll close with the words of but in an old song, rise, O man of God, and have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and strength and mind and serve the King of Kings. Rise up, O man of God, the church for you does wait. Our strength unequal to our task. Rise up, make her great. And that's what God has called us to do. Rise up in the name of Jesus.